All right, now we're going to discuss hypertension, which is one of the most common diagnoses in my practice. And unfortunately, across the United States, hypertension is getting more common as our population ages and also gets heavier. Uh, so it's really important to understand hypertension, its diagnosis and management. And that's exactly what we're about to do. So let's start with a case. I've got a 51-year-old female, no past medical history and taking no medications. Good for you. Um, but her blood pressure today is 146 over 90, and her pulse is 86 beats per minute. The rest of her physical ex examination is unremarkable. So what's the next best step in her care? Should we talk about lifestyle changes and recheck her blood pressure in one to two weeks? Or should we start her on a thiazide diuretic, start an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker? Or is her blood pressure actually within normal limits and therefore we can just see her next year for another wellness examination? What would you choose? Well, the answer is A, and it's pretty clearly A in this case. Because remember that the diagnosis of hypertension requires a blood pressure reading of 130 over 80 millimeters or more on at least two separate occasions. Now, the number may be a little bit controversial. You'll see uh, different recommendations from different groups, but 130 millimeters per, of mercury is generally the consensus now. And it's certainly the consensus broadly that it has to be measured on at least two occasions. So it's best if the patient can do some testing at home. Home blood pressure is more correlated than office blood pressure with cardiovascular events like stroke and myocardial infarction. Um, and if they can vary the time, morning and night, on both arms. Yes, you know, in terms of ver practicality and can a lot of patients do that? Some can, some, some cannot. Um, you want to see a, a blood pressure that's high in both your office setting and the home setting that's validating. And uh, one thing we can do as physicians is there's some value in doing both sitting and standing uh, blood pressure in both arms in the office. And uh, that give, gives a slightly truer reading and therefore a higher um, accuracy for their future risk of cardiovascular events. So remember that among patients uh, who are older than 60 years, and this is a controversial um, idea, but it's, it's part of what the Joint National Commission 8 uh, recommended for, uh, for blood pressure, that their blood pressure can be allowed to increase up to 149 millimeters of mercury safely. Um, certainly we see older adults getting in trouble with too aggressive a treatment of blood pressure and particularly in, in my practice, patients over 80 years old, those who might be a little bit more frail, um, who may be 61 years old but they may be 41 years old, if they're very frail, um, I get nervous about trying to push their blood pressure towards those normal 120 systolic levels and they may be allowed to, to go up a little bit. That said, I've got 85 year olds who are very vital and active and uh, for them I, I maintain that uh, blood pressure target. So it's, it's really I think up to you and your individual patient. The age provides a basic guideline but it's more about your the risk of pushing your patient too low with their blood pressure for that individual patient and how frail they are. Now and the JNC8 no longer recommends that the systolic blood pressure be treated to less than 130 millimeters per, of mercury among um, patients with diabetes or with chronic kidney disease. Now, what about secondary hypertension? When do you see that? I think a secondary hypertension, it's, it's rare. It's only up to 10% of cases of hypertension. It's probably less than that. Um, but especially in a middle-aged adult, when they come in with a very high blood pressure, and particularly a blood pressure that's not well controlled on initial therapy, you can consider some differential diagnosis. Thyroid disease is very easy to test for and pretty common. But oftentimes it will also be associated with other symptoms and a pulse if they're hyperthyroid that's high. So therefore, uh, you can ferret out that they have thyroid disease from, from other historical factors. It's rare when it's just sitting there um, and the only symptom it's really you know, causing is high blood pressure. Hyperaldosteronism can be a problem, Kahn syndrome. Um, so look for electrolyte abnormalities associated with that. Renal artery stenosis is the most common cause of secondary hypertension. And if it's middle-aged adults, you're probably talking about acquired renal artery uh, stenosis as opposed to congenital renal artery stenosis. This, you know, watch what their, um, their uh, GFR, their glomerular filtration rate is doing, watch their creatinine levels, uh, but it often needs um, analysis with something like either a CT or magnetic resonance uh, angiography of the renal arteries. 
And pheochromocytoma, we all worry about it. It's actually incredibly rare. And again, these patients usually have other symptoms, tremor, uh, sweating, and weight loss uh, that can give away the fact that they have this excess of catecholamines. It's rare that it's just, oh, the blood pressure is, um, is elevated by itself. What do you do to evaluate patients once they are diagnosed with hypertension? Everybody gets a baseline electrocardiogram, looking for things like left ventricular hypertrophy or prior cardiac damage, a glucose level or an HbA1c, something to screen for diabetes, something to screen for hyperlipidemia, um, a check of their electrolytes along with their kidney function as well as a hemoglobin level, and urinalysis or a microalbumin creatinine ratio to check for the possibility of proteinuria and early kidney disease. That's your baseline. And these essentially should re be repeated at least when we talk about um, the, the electrolytes, the urinalysis um, on an annual basis. A at least, at least an annual basis. Remember that lifestyle changes are still at the foundation for the treatment of hypertension. And actually, if you look at something like the uh, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, that, that reduction on average with uh, 11 and a half over five and a half points uh, of mercury is really remarkable. That's more powerful than most antihypertensive agents. And obviously patients can do it with DASH. That's gonna yield other good things in terms of their cholesterol and their metabolism, their body weight. Um, so there's side benefits to that diet that are really wonderful, but you know, that, that reduction in blood pressure values is, is outstanding. Weight loss um, certainly promotes um, uh, lower blood pressure as well, so that's one of the benefits of, say, bariatric surgery. A lot of uh, patients are cured of hypertension uh, following uh, the significant weight loss they experience with bariatric surgery. But even following a good diet and exercise and losing four kilos uh, can result in a significant reduction in blood pressure. And exercise, as I mentioned, in and of itself can reduce blood pressure as well. So uh, these are the keys, and uh, you can see that if you put all these things together, uh, many patients wouldn't, you know, could avoid uh, medical therapy completely if they really embraced uh, diet and exercise. So let's return to our case. Um, she's actually come back to clinic now, and her repeat blood pressure, un unfortunately, despite trying to do her lifestyle changes in the past two weeks, is 150 over 94. Her pulse is 86 beats per minute. So now what do you want to do? Do you want to allow six months for her lifestyle changes to have an effect since she started them? Do you want to start a thiazide diuretic, start an alpha adrenergic blocker, or start a beta blocker? Which one would you choose? I would go with the thiazide diuretic. That is recommended as a first-line therapy by JNC8. So here are the first-line treatments after lifestyle for hypertension. Um, can be a th and JNC8 left this fairly open. Um, and again, these are only recommendations, but the recommendations are broad and catch most patients, I think. Thiazide diuretics are a great, uh, alter a great option for patients. One thing whenever I prescribe a diuretic um, is that I will ask them if they have any urinary issues. Um, many older adults have overactive bladder or benign prostatic hypertrophy and therefore already uh, may be struggling uh, with uh, genital urinary issues. I don't want to exacerbate that by giving them a thiazide diuretic. I would choose something else for those patients. The other thing is prescribing a thiazide alone, watch closely for the potassium because thiazide pr uh, promotes hypokalemia. Whereas ACE inhibitors and ARBs, also considered a first-line uh, agent, uh, can promote hyperkalemia. So therefore, the, uh, a combination of one of those agents with a thiazide is helpful um, in terms of maintaining normal kalemia. And calcium channel blockers have their own range of side effects, but one thing they don't do uh, much is affect electrolytes. It's also worth noting that atenolol is not recommended by JNC8. It doesn't confer overall the same mortality benefit for cardiovascular disease that these other agents maintain. And of course, there's JNC8 includes some specific recommendations uh, based on the patient you may see. And these are good things that may come up on your examination, certainly come up in clinic. Uh, black patients respond better to drugs like calcium channel blockers and thiazide diuretics versus drugs like ACE inhibitors. If they have chronic kidney disease, uh, try to initiate an ACE inhibitor or an ARB and titrate to at least moderate doses. It will slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. Of course, watch the creatinine and watch the potassium in those patients too. 
Among patients with coronary artery disease, the, the best uh, drugs are a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor or an, or an uh, angiotensin receptor blocker for preventing recurrent cardiac events. In diabetes, start an ACE inhibitor or an ARB um, that, because it can help with nephropathy. Interestingly though, remember that patients who don't have uh, nephropathy don't necessarily benefit um, from an ACE or an ARB in, in, when they have diabetes. So it's really only after they develop nephropathy or when they have diabetes and hypertension that you introduce an ACE or ARB. And then finally, non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers uh, can be effective. They can't tolerate um, an ACE or an ARB in those patients with diabetes. And we'll talk, uh, heart failure requires uh, a few different drugs. The core drugs to, are listed there, either an ACE or an ARB, plus a beta blocker, and then consider spironolactone for those patients too. That's a lot. <laughs> and you can feel really stressed out and lost, um, and I understand that. But you don't want to get too overly focused on the initial choice. I see a lot of clinicians really struggling. Okay, what's the best choice for my patient? JNC8 gives you latitude between several different classes of drugs, but don't worry about it too much because oftentimes you're going to be adding a second or even a third agent onto those patients with hypertension. So the one you start now will be a solo act for only the next you know, two to four weeks till you evaluate the patient again. If their blood pressure is still up, you might add a second agent. And then also when choosing drugs, uh, don't forget that really it's that number is the, the most important thing. So say you have a patient with diabetes and nephropathy, but they really have a hard time taking any of those drugs, the non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker, um, ACE inhibitor, ARB, they can't tolerate any of them, but they really enjoy and what they, the only thing they can tolerate is um, an alpha antagonist or a beta blocker. You know, it's not the ideal drug for that patient, but if it gets their blood pressure down uh, towards goal, that's much more important than getting, than getting them just on the, the right drug uh, for their chronic medical condition. Hopefully that was really helpful in our brief review of hypertension. I enjoyed it, I enjoyed preparing it, and I think it'll help a lot of your patients. Thanks.